Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the latest edition of the Great Exhibition Road Festival's Explore at Home series. Uh, my name is James, I work at Imperial College London who are one of the festival partners. Today uh, we're going to be exploring performance and how studying it in detail can help teach uh, medics and musicians the future. We might even learn a little bit about how this new field of performance science can help many of us in our day-to-day -day work or maybe even our social lives. It certainly seems that whether it's in the preparation and planning or the, the nerve-rushing experience of stepping on stage, there's a, there's a lot we can learn from some of the world's great performers. To help uh, in this lunchtime exploration, uh, I'm joined by three experts from the worlds of music and medicine to discuss what they have learned from researching and teaching performance. Uh, I'll introduce them all shortly. However, first I wanted to remind all our viewers that this is an interactive discussion, so we'd love to hear from you too. Uh, in particular, it would be great to know what the word performance means to you. Uh, my colleague uh, will be posting a link in the YouTube chat uh, shortly. Uh, it'll ask you for a, a couple of words that you might associate with performance. Uh, we'll, um, later on in the discussion, we'll show those results, anonymized, of course, so you won't be, uh, you won't be able to see your name associated with any particular frightening word. Uh, but it'll be great for our experts to sort of have a look at those, see what, you, what your thoughts are, reflect on your uh, uh, your words and discuss them. Uh, I would like to just add that for those using the chat function uh, and or filling in the poll, please do be considerate of others. Uh, we want to create a, a welcoming space for this online conversation. So, you know, we love passion, enthusiasm, but let's avoid anything that disrupts the experience for others. So uh, if that's all understood, uh, it's time to meet our guests. Today's speakers join us uh, from the Centre for Performance Science, which is uh, an interdisciplinary research centre. There's a collaboration between Imperial and the Royal College of Music. They're here today to talk about their work studying and teaching performance in order to improve practice across the field of music and medicine. So I'm delighted to introduce one by one. Uh, first of all, Roger Kneebone, who leads the Centre for Performance Science. Roger is a clinician and educationalist whose multidisciplinary research builds on his experience in surgery and general practice, as well as his interests and expertise beyond medicine. Hello. We're, all, hello. We're also joined by Terry Clark, a research fellow within the centre. Hello, Terry. Uh, Terry completed a Bachelor of Music in Flute Performance at the University of Calgary, while his doctoral training at the Royal College of Music focused on mental skills in musicians' development. Today, Terry designs and conducts pediological and research initiatives focused on the use of interdisciplinary experiential learning uh, of business and entrepreneurship skills. And finally, we have uh, Natasha Halton. Hi, Natasha. Good afternoon. Nat Good afternoon. Nat Natasha is a medical doctor and teaching fellow who designs healthcare and performance-based simulations to enhance experiential learning among medical students and doctors. Thank you so much, all three of you, for joining us. So um, to start off with, because we're talking about performance, uh, I thought it might be quite nice. And also, I guess we're asking our audience for their sort of personal experience and word associations with performance. I wonder if it might it might be quite nice to, to start off by asking each of you to talk us through a time in your life when you have had to perform and maybe been had a couple of butterflies in the stomach, a bit of nerves ahead of that performance. Um, maybe, Roger, can I come to you first? Yes, uh, well, um, thanks, James. As, as you said in your introduction, my, my first career was in surgery. And uh, for a number of years, about five years, I was doing mostly trauma surgery in southern Africa. Um, so there I was I was operating on people who'd been injured, very often stabbed or shot, sometimes blown up or, or run over, all sorts of things. Um, and I vividly remember being at the beginning of an operation, actually very often it would happen like this, when when somebody was on the operating table, they'd just been put to sleep by my anaesthetic colleagues, and I was getting ready to start an operation, usually opening up somebody's abdominal cavity to see what was wrong and to uh, and to try and put it right. And and particularly with, with stab wounds, you, you never really quite know what you're going to find. With other kinds of surgery, you've got a lot of information in advance about what you're planning to do and what you're likely to find, although, of course, it can surprise you but in trauma surgery you really don't know what you're going to encounter it could be a relatively minor injury it could be something absolutely catastrophic and whatever it is you have to deal with it uh, and so that sense of um as you said james but of having butterflies in in your stomach which to me was both a um it was an exciting thing but also a a, a rather scary thing because 
um it was i think a question of being of being um ready ready to take on something where the stakes were high um being confident uh, reasonably confident that I would be able to cope with whatever it was, but not being absolutely sure what the whether I would be pushed to the limits of, of of what I had previously done and what I was able to do, and I think that sense of of knowing to some extent what's likely to happen, but not knowing everything about it, and that sense of uncertainty, which which created both excitement and apprehension. Yeah, absolutely. There, there seems to be sort of a yeah two sides to the coin in in, in this, and, it, and it, maybe it's maybe part of the what we've been talking about today is, is having the tools to sort of take the benefits from it uh, and and not succumb to some of the negative side of things. Maybe Terry, could I come to you? Maybe in your flautist career, you might have a performance in mind. As a musician, there have been plenty. Yeah, there's no no shortage of anxiety inducing moments. Um, but there's one that stands out particularly in my mind. Uh, it was when I was uh, completing my master's degree in flute performance, and I was playing in the pit orchestra for a, a production of the musical Candide. And uh, there's an en there's a particular entrance in that musical where the flute comes in uh, all by themselves uh, in a very very low. Uh, note and, and uh, this is a particularly challenging type of entry uh, well for me anyways but for flute players one of the things when I get nervous is that my throat has started to constrict up a little bit which is exactly the opposite of what you want uh, as a flute player and so during the dress rehearsal actually uh, I'd managed to not come in when I was supposed to and it was very obvious that I had not come in when I was supposed to and so I was terrified that this was actually going to happen in, in the, the the shows um, and it was actually at that point so I had done a lot of sport as well in my youth um, and dealing with performance anxiety and working with sports psychologists is something that we've done a lot within the sports but I never really thought of applying that to music I mean this was 20 years ago and we didn't talk about how do we how do we manage performance anxiety but as I was sat in the pit I realized that actually there were all sorts of strategies that I'd been using for years within sport that would work just as well uh, for helping me manage anxiety within music. And so that was actually a turning point for me, realizing that um, if I started to look beyond music, there was actually all sorts of insight I could gain into how do I prepare for performances? How do I manage performance anxiety? Um, so that was, yeah, as I say, that moment really stands out for me. Thank you. Yes, great. Yeah, that, that's all coming in, you know, that, that first note that you had to play, that, that's the, the, you know, the build up to that and, and being able to sort of uh, adjust that and then, you know, generally things seem to get a bit better, certainly from my experiences in sports and things like that. It seems things mm -hmm. seem a bit easier after the first time you touch the ball or the first you know, delivery you bowl in cricket or whatever it is. So yeah, mate, there's yeah. Certainly, there certainly seems to be parables from other from other walks of life. Uh, Natasha, yeah. can I come to you? Thank you, James. Um, so similar to Terry, lots of things throughout the years that, that have been nerve inducing performances. But I think that one that particularly stands out to me was my first day as a real doctor. Um, and I was assigned to the cardiology ward and I had spent many years practicing skills and learning knowledge to be a doctor, but this was the first time that I was doing it for real and, and, and making decisions that were gonna impact my patients. And I remember wanting to portray competence and confidence and a calm in control doctor but on the inside I was mostly lost I'd never been to the hospital before and terrified um, and I remember then and many years later still reflecting on that difference between the internal terror and the face that we want to show on the outside um, and I wasn't pretending to be a doctor I was a doctor but I just hadn't quite grown into that role yet um, and the performance needed to be more confident than I really was. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for those guys. I think we've had some um, really nice responses to the polls about people's own sort of associations when it comes uh, about the word performance and what it means to them, what it con conjures up in their mind. Uh, I don't know if we can see uh, we can see the results of those and have a look at some of the well, nerves. Not maybe not surprisingly, nerves is one of the ones that's come up there. Um, practice, well, yeah, uh, uh, something that might help with nerves potentially. <laughs> Harmony of ideas, expression, active acting show. As you guys who uh, study performance and have looked at it from that sort of academic perspective, is there any words that uh, from that list that sort of particularly resonate with you guys in terms of how you've seen it or what you've experienced personally? Well, as I think you've started us off, um, James, the, the nerves is definitely a big part and, and something that many people often associate uh, with with performance. I mean, certainly from a, a musician's perspective, um, working with students at the Royal College of Music, that's one of the, the key things they want to try and get a grapple on as well. Um, obviously, a lot of their time is spent honing their their 
musical, their, their technical skills, but they are only able to really share and display those things when unhindered by uh, their nerves. So how do they stop nerves getting in the way? That's a big part of it. I think, I think that, that, that one about pressure is also interesting. Oh. The, the idea that you, that you do stuff, as, as Natasha was saying, you, you, you do stuff when you're doing it for real that however much you've practiced it or rehearsed it or, or done it in other environments is never quite the same as actually doing it when you're under the pressure, pressure of, of doing it when, when it really counts, when there's a patient who might get hurt or when there's an audience there listening to you or watching you. And I think there's, there's, something, um, there's something very important about that transition that, that Natasha was, was, well, that you were both talking about. Mm -hmm. I think when you're actually doing something and it counts, I thought uh, the being being present, someone wrote as a phrase. I, I thought that was really interesting. I, I I tend to sort of remove myself from the reality of the experience if I'm trying to deal with nerves. But maybe maybe embracing being present is a better way of doing it. I, I don't know. And there was one yeah. other word, the collaboration. Um, and I think that was getting bigger and bigger as it went along. But, you know, all performances are a collaboration, either whether you're playing in an ensemble or working in a team, but even a solo performance, even if it's just a doctor and a patient, you're still collaborating with your audience. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting one and one that maybe not everybody associates with performance. I noticed as well in there that was challenge. Um, and I think that's one of the things that really highlights a performance is that it, it's out in, in many cases, it's out sort of in, in the real world. And that comes with risk and uncertainty and, and all challenges. Um, and so the way in which performers view those challenges um, can, can really have a great impact on things like nerves, but also how well the performance unfolds too. Brilliant. Okay, so I've got. Uh, we're going to go on to this section of the event where uh, I ask some uh, uh, questions to our panelists. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we this is an interactive event. So as well as filling in your poll, your your job as viewers isn't done yet. We we'd still love to hear your comments. Uh, if you want to elaborate on any of those words and give us some uh, stories from your own performance uh, career, or if you have any questions about the sort of the science of performance and how and uh, and what we're going to be talking about today, about how it can be used to apply to sort of medical teaching, uh, we'd be delighted to hear those and we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye out and we'll put those to our panel. But I wondered if we could start off with a question I had, um, uh, which was on the actual, the word performance itself and the act of performance. I guess maybe, Terry, I'd like to come to you in a musical setting. It seems to me that performance is much more than simply in a musical setting, just playing the note, right notes in the right order. Uh, as, as, a, as a musician, can you can you start by telling us a little bit about what performance means to you, really? Of course. Thanks, James. I think the answer to this question depends in part upon the stage of development of the musician. So as you point out, it's easy to think of musical performance uh, being about playing or singing the right notes in the right order and in the manner that you would like to perform them. So a public display of physical skill, I guess, in other words. But if we think more broadly about it, performance represents the culmination of hours and years of work of preparation. It's the opportunity to finally share that work with others. So this brings up then the idea of performance as a shared experience between mm -hmm. performer and the audience, where in a sense, both are making and experiencing something. And so within the shared experience, as we were saying a little bit before the this is, you know, essentially the, the public display of a physical skill, but it's occurring within conditions of risk and uncertainty. So there's uncertainty about how the performance will unfold. There may be risks or repercussions if the public display doesn't go as well as it could or should. Um, so together, this can add adrenaline and excitement uh, for all involved. So I think it's one of the reasons why we really love watching live performances and how that's such a different experience than watching a recording of, of a performance. We know how the, the recording will go, but um, there's that uncertainty within a live performance. Um, there's also the connection that's developed between performers and audiences. So performing isn't just from a musical perspective, in many perform perspectives, isn't simply about the performer creating and then sending something over towards a passive audience, but it involves creating a connection and a shared space for that experience. Audience members want to feel and be moved by a performance. The musician then must work out how to play the right notes in a way that moves people. The energy a performer receives from the audience then, if they are open to it and aware of it, can really help them achieve this. It's really interesting that yeah, that, 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 that sort of dual relation that relationship between audience and performer. I, I, yeah, I, I sometimes get a little bit. I have an apprehension, and sometimes of going to. Though I love going to see live performances, uh, like I, I need to be eased into it. If, uh, like if, I, I worry a little bit at the start, and then when I realise that everyone's, you know, the performance is really good or the the musician's great, I kind of relax into it and then can enjoy it. So it's kind of a as an audience member, I have a weird relationship with 
uh, with the sort of live performance, uh, where there's kind of a more of a certainty as to watching something recorded, like going to the cinema and watching a film. Uh, this is quite interesting. Is there anything, maybe Roger, from a, a medical setting, is there anything there, what does performance mean in, in that setting? And is there anything there you can pick up from what Terry said that was sort of similarities or, um, yeah? Mm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think uh, in medicine, performance is, is very often live. Uh, and it has consequences <laughs> for lots of people concerned. So, I mean, the first when I first started thinking about this, I thought back to my surgical career and I thought about performing operations. I mean, we talk about performing operations. Uh, even the word is is the same. And and I think there, it, in a way, you are, or well, my focus was on being part of an ensemble, part of a, a group of people. Uh, and whatever I was doing was 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 part of a group activity and other people were aware of it and judging it and responding to it and so i thought and in a sense the the patient was almost the patient as a person became invisible in a way because most of the <clears throat> surgery i was doing was on people under general anesthetic and so of course although everybody was focusing very on, intently on that patient in terms of their body the patient as a person had sort of <clears throat> become veiled for the duration of the surgery, and so the the audience, if there was one, was was the was the other people, the other professionals, colleagues in in the room. So there was that element of performance. But then, um, as James mentioned afterwards, I, I changed career direction particularly, and for almost twenty years after that, I became a GP, a family doctor, back in the UK in Wiltshire, uh, and there I started to I started to think more and more about the consultation, the clinical consultation in terms of performance uh, and more recently through the work we've done at the Centre for Performance Science and with some of the other performers from different areas which I expect we'll come on to later mm -hmm. the idea of the clinical consultation as a close-up live performance with a very small audience very often an audience of just one uh, namely one patient and so that that idea that that what you might see simply as a as a as a conversation or or, or, or just a place where uh, somebody comes with a problem, somebody else makes a diagnosis, comes up with a treatment and, and puts it in. But it's much more complex than that. It's very much uh, a sort of mutually constituted performance where each each person who takes part is both performer and audience for the other people who take part. Uh, and so from that point of view, I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about already about performance uh, are visible there. In the clinical consultation but we often don't frame the, the clinical consultation as performance and therefore we often i think don't even notice some of those aspects because we're thinking if a, a doctor's probably thinking about could it be this disease could it be that disease what kind of scientific knowledge should i bring in and the patient might be thinking about here's my problem i hope this person whoever they are will be able to help me fix it but but they probably aren't thinking about it in terms of performer and audience but if we do think about it in those terms all sorts of interesting things come into view. I think there's a comment here from Sasha, which I think sort of pick, uh, picks up on that. Well, it picks up on the, that that performance is more that it, is an ability to can be an ability to put uh, someone at ease or to sort of create the right atmosphere. For she says, uh, I completely agree. A performance communication of how at ease they feel or how confident they feel can help me feel less anxious for them. I think there's there's more that's more than just the the carrying out of the duty or the skill. There's there's a whole demeanor or something maybe slightly untangible. Yeah, uh, and I think that goes back to what Natasha was saying when she said that, you know, on her first day as a real doctor, she had to present how she wanted her patients to perceive her as a real doctor, even though inside it may have been very and it was very different. And I think there's something about projecting your your point of awareness to registering how you how you want to come over and how you and monitoring how you are coming over as far as you can judge to your audience to the other person or people you're with um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more in terms of of music and how a musicians or ensembles perception of what they're doing lands with the audience who are listening to them but I think it also happens in medicine and I think it actually happens in everyday conversation and it's happening to all of us right now where we are registering uh, one another's responses. And if I suddenly saw um, Natasha closing her eyes and then going away, coming back, reading a magazine, um, <laughs> uh, I, I would I would be drawing all sorts of inf inferences from that about the success of the performance that we're all that we're all conducting. 
But I think it starts to raise um, or, or it opens the opportunity to start thinking around what variables or factors or what contributes to success, as you were just talking about there, Roger. So interesting looking at some of the comments coming in, things around confidence. And James, as you were saying before, you want this the performance to be in a safe pair of hands and empathy, as Vivian's talking about here. Um, it's easy to think that performance from a, a musical perspective is how technically flawlessly one can deliver their performance but actually when you start to think around the whole range of factors the the certainly the musical variables but also the psychological and the, the communicative factors that start to contribute into and influence the sort of perceived success of a performance then it really starts to broaden out our our understanding of uh, well, of those things, but also from a sort of training and development perspective, what things should we be uh, training uh, or, or, or skills should we be equipping our, our young performers with, music, musical or medical, whoever they might be. Natasha, I wonder if you want to, we talked a little bit about, well, we've put you in context there or reflected back on your that you and your first day on the ward. So is there anything, uh, looking back now as you are someone who sort of is involved in the education uh, side of things, is there is there anything that we've talked about now which uh, you wish you'd known on that first day or anything that, uh, um, yeah, yeah, anything, anything that might have helped you in terms of sort of coping or portraying yourself in the way you want to portray or just making you realise that you could do it, you were in a good position you know, you yeah. qualified, you have the tools, you go out there and perform. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are many things I wish I'd known on that first day. Um, but in terms of looking at things that we're doing now, looking at performance, I didn't think of myself as a performer then. And I think many doctors don't think of themselves as performers. And it's been a much more recent evolution in my thinking that I start to view that way. Um, but when we do start reframing clinical interactions as a performance where we are using skills that we've built up for and with somebody else, we can draw on insights that maybe don't traditionally belong in our field. So, I mean, there are many examples, but one of them would be how you prepare for, for a performance, how you get into the right mindset, how you get into the right mind frame, whether that's using warm-ups or pre-performance routines or techniques. Um, and this is something that, you know, Terry actively teaches to his students at the, at the Royal College of Music um, and something that I, was never taught and I think many doctors just rush straight into these high stakes situations without ensuring that they get into the right mindset because it's not part of our thinking and that's one of the areas that we're working on and are very interested in looking at developing bespoke educational interventions to help young doctors and trainee doctors understand how they can prepare for performance. Yeah, we're going to talk a bit, a bit more about some of those projects. Uh, yeah, I, I think one well, there's something that really interests me about what makes a successful performance. And and Terry, you talked about people being terrified about playing wrong notes, and indeed you missing your entry at that dress rehearsal. And Natasha, you've talked about this anxiety about not having, you know, not remembering stuff. And 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 I think there's something very interesting about how when people become experienced as performers they are aware that a performance can be successful even though some of its components are not mm. um and and so for instance in my own experience i i would find as a gp that i could sometimes have a successful successful consultation even though there were things that i forgot or didn't know or or or, or, or stuff that i mm. would have liked to have known but didn't and it made me think back to a long time ago when i was a, a student i went to a concert by a very famous uh, pianist called Arthur Rubenstein, who some people will know about, is very famous for playing Chopin. And he was, it, this was, it turned out to be just a few months before he died. He was very old. And he played a whole lot of pieces by Chopin. And there were loads and loads and loads of wrong notes. Even I could hear them. Um, but it didn't actually matter because the performance itself was fantastic. It was by this iconic pianist. And the, the sense of emotion and all those years of experience and and, and everything kind of completely uh, sort of put into the shade, the fact that there were loads of wrong notes. Whereas I, I, I imagine that if somebody was doing that at an earlier stage in their career, they would be severely marked down uh, uh, and there would be bad consequences for playing so many wrong notes. But actually at that later stage in Rubenstein's career, that really didn't matter. And it got rave reviews and everybody I spoke to afterwards who'd been there thought it was fantastic, although everybody heard the wrong notes. But there's something about performance being bigger than its component parts, I think. 
Yeah, it's, un, it's almost putting unnecessary pressure on yourself to aim for perfection. It, may, it might not be the, always the best way of going about it, I guess. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit. We had a question from Steve, which was, a, uh, which was about the author and composer and how they feel when the work is performed and whether there's any uh, parables or comparables in the world of medicine. I was quite interested myself in sort of the different roles in a performance and whether that affects... Um, how people feel or the sort of challenges so someone who has responsibility for the ultimate output or whereas somewhere as opposed to someone who's maybe a, a, contri a contributing part of it and is only really responsible for their for their part of the performance i don't know terry in the musical world is there anything where different roles have different uh, uh requirements or experiences around performance that need to be catered for yeah absolutely and a lot of it I think it depends to a large extent on ex exposure, for instance. So are you, as you say, one of many uh, on a part? So are you, you know, fourth desk, second violin, so one of 10 or 12 violins playing exactly the same part? Or in my own case, are you one of two flute players in an orchestra and you are each playing your own part, for instance? So uh, what is the exposure there? Is Is it all down to you or can you sort of to what extent can you rely on others around you? Um, it, it's an interesting thing within orchestras. We don't really understand, sort of, we have a sense of the hierarchy, but not necessarily the leadership and therefore the responsibility uh, of the whole. We might think that the conductor is ultimately responsible, and yet they're the only one up there not making sound. Um, so we have the, the, the concert master, the leader of the orchestra, sort of the, typically the first violinist, uh, the principal violinist, um, who is playing and is supposed to have some responsibility for all of it. We have the section leaders, uh, so the, the principal player for each of the instrument groups. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot a lot within that, and, but it, it does seem to come about or uh, be influenced to a large extent, as I say, on, on this notion of exposure um, and whether it's just you on your part or whether you're, you're part of a larger team within in your part as well. I guess whether you have whether if you've kind of devolved or outsourced responsibility for certain parts to another person, your ultimate control of the of what the output is is sort of reduced. I guess in a sense, so whether that conjures more apprehension and anxiety, or whether that makes it slightly easier, I don't know. Maybe that depends on the type of person. I guess Natasha or uh, um, you've you've played you might have played various different roles in your career within a sort of a team performance. How, how have you? Uh, is there a is there a, a, an equivalent of a conductor in the in in the in, in the medical setting, or yeah. I don't know if you played that role? That's an interesting question. Um, so I'm relatively early in my career. So insofar as there is a conductor, it wouldn't be me. Um, <laughs> but I do think that there are some very interesting parallels here. So medicine is a team based um, a team based profession, particularly obvious in places like surgery. But even in in a hospital ward, just a general hospital ward, medicine has a hierarchy and we all work together in teams and you would typically work with a consultant who ultimately takes responsibility for what happens in his team and for all of the work done his or her team i should say and for all of the work done within it um but that consultant that that leader isn't always present aren't always on the wards in many ways it's their juniors who are the workers of the team as it were and they might call they might get advice um, and then enact decisions made by the consultant, by the leader. Um, but ultimately, the leader has to trust their work. They can give advice and they are responsible for the outcome. But much of the actual doing is carried out by somebody else. And I wonder whether that's a little bit like trusting that your work or your decisions are going to be implemented properly. What do you think, Roger? Well, yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely. But it, it's, it's, I mean, I, I find it interesting sort of gaining experience in the in the world of surgery because wow. to begin with I, I was keen to do surgery and so I, I sort of joined members of the surgical team for I'm talking about the the what goes on in the operating theater of course an awful lot of surgery happens in clinics or wards or looking after patients before and after but let's just think about the operating theater for a moment and to begin with uh, I when I got to the stage of being able to take part in operations I was doing um very sort of sub subordinate things. I was usually uh, being a, a second or third as assistant, as it's called. So the surgeon would be, this would be talking about open surgery mostly. Um, and I would be usually hanging on to what's called a retractor, which is a sort of metal instrument for holding 
uh, some sort of piece of the, the some organ or intestine out of the way. And very often I would be holding one end of, of a, a long thing which would go into the patient's body. I'd be hidden behind other people and I couldn't even see the business end of the retractor. Of course, for the surgeon, this was crucially important because if I if my attention lapsed and I let it slip and a bit of intestine popped out and obscured their view or something, it could be dangerous and was certainly very irritating. But I couldn't see that happening. So what I saw was was extremely boring, tedious work, which I didn't really understand. Uh, and uh, all I got was backache and boredom. Um, but of course, I had to do it because it was a crucial part of being in the team. And then when I became more experienced, I began to realize more and more and more how important that role was, because then the sh my spotlight was shifting to things that I could only do it, 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 when I had a different place in that team. Uh, and when those people who were doing the kind of jobs that I thought was rather menial and boring, I discovered really how crucial those jobs were. So I think in a, in a way, at the early stages, you don't yet see the bigger picture of, of where you fit in. Um, and and this idea of uh, uh, maybe it's a bit like orchestral conductors, I don't know. And, and people who, as you say, Terry, who, you, you know, maybe only come in after the symphony has been going on for 25 minutes and then only for a few seconds and then out again. And, and I'm sure they could easily switch off during the times when they're not actually playing. But actually, you need everybody to be involved in the performance all the time, even if they're not being particularly active all the time. Um, and so there's something I think about shifting, broadening your awareness as you become more and more experienced and take on more senior roles within a team um, that that mean you really have to have been through that early stage yourself. Because I think if you swoop in and expect it all to happen, you haven't got that sort of insider knowledge of how it feels like at the early stages that allow you to support and shape and direct the team that you're then leading. I guess inside knowledge and maybe a bit of empathetic understanding of of, of the realities of what yeah what it was like performing that role. Um, I wanted to come on to another subject which we had a lot of questions actually in advance of, uh, maybe understandably, which is around nerves and particularly stage fright. Um, and just before I do that, uh, there's a couple. Of, I just wanted to read out a couple of comments, some interesting comments we've had from audiences. We had someone uh, from Z who is a, is a teacher. She, uh, they say uh, or ZW I think actually sorry uh, said as a teacher performance is key. You act confident in front of the children and they respond with young children dramatic performance is also a helpful tool for engagement and learning i think yeah it's really yeah. thank you very much for that it's a really good point um we also had a, a comment from steve i work with a number of charity uh, volunteers preparation is key to my performance and knowing your audience and listening picking up clues as to how well you are communicating so it's an ongoing process even during the live performance itself yeah, i guess mm -hmm. that's not always the case if you're on stage uh, playing your flute beautifully like Terry was, you might not always have that immediate audience feedback, but uh, for some performance, the performers, they can kind of adapt during the actual performance itself, which might be quite handy. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, keep those coming. We'll, I'll keep finding little gaps where I can read them out. So please, and any questions as well would be really useful. Uh, so yes, let's come on to sort of stage fright and nerves. Um, so we had a question from uh, Neil who asked uh, in, ahead of time, he asked, is stage fright just fear of failure? Uh, and then we had another question um, from Rebecca, which is on, uh, more specifically on the medical setting about how do surgeons manage their nerves? particularly physiological symptoms when the stakes are so high. So I wanted to get, I wanted to get a musical and a, me a medical perspective on this. Uh, maybe uh, let's start with the medical perspective, but potentially first. Uh, Natasha, do you want to kick us off about managing nerves? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so I think that managing nerves is a combination of preparation, and that might sound a little bit trite, but if you want to be ready to be able to respond and, and and feel confident, you need to have that basic preparation done. You need to actually know that you are qualified and you are competent to face whatever's coming next. Um, so I think that's one key aspect, but we also know that all the preparation in the world doesn't necessarily take away the nerves. Um, so I think that there are some specific sort of psychological tools that you can use um, whether that's having a routine that you do the same every time before you enter a, a big performance, um, whether that's making sure that you've addressed all of the practical day-to-day -day things, like making sure you have all of your equipment ready so that you can reduce your cognitive load and know that, that your key tools are there when you need them, um, or whether that's drawing on specific psychological 
practical techniques that I'm sure Terry could talk about more, um, such as practicing imagery um, or mindfulness or self-talk, you know, actual evidence-based strategies for controlling nerves. Um, but I think that the reason it's so important to be prepared, to be in the right mind frame and to control your nerves is because only when you've done all of those things are you going to be able to actually give a good performance to engage with your audience or your patients to to hear their feedback and respond to their cues. Because if you're not in the right mind frame or you're not prepared, you're so absorbed in what you need to do that you don't have that extra space. What about um, Terry in the musical setting? Uh, what um, ha is stage fright just fear of failure? Is there more to it? And is it important to understand what is actually happening to someone as they're experiencing it in order to sort of develop mechanisms or ways that you can avoid it uh, for themselves in future or for others? Um, well, I guess to start with the first part of your question, is it fear of failure? Um, a large part of it seems to stem from that. Um, I should probably, or if it were possible, defer to um, a PhD student I'm working with, uh, Bex, who, who, is, who is actually trying to untangle uh, that at the moment. Um, but that fear of failure is a big part of it. Um, but where does that perception of failure come from? Whose failure? In whose eyes are you failing yourself and audiences, uh, a panel, a critic? Um, but also then, it's not just the failure in sense of the wrong notes, but more so what are the repercussions of that that failure perhaps? Does it mean you will never grace a stage again? Nobody will ever pay uh, to come hear you perform again? Uh, or does your own, I don't know, self identity or self sense of self identity and worth take a, a hit? Um, so it, yeah, fear of failure perhaps, but it's, it's um, uh, a bit more complex than that, I think it is. Um, but to the second part then, how do we actually, um, uh, manage that. Uh, it's been interesting watching some of the comments coming in here and a lot of discussion on the importance of preparation. Uh, absolutely, as musicians, we love to practice. Um, Malcolm Gladwell popularized uh, some work by uh, uh, the psychologist Anders Ericsson, actually, who was looking at the, the number of hours required to attain expertise. Uh, Ericsson had come up with uh, a figure of 10,000 hours. Um, Gladwell then popularized that into the tenure rule, I think. Um, and, and so, yeah, musicians live and, live and breathe that. We love to practice. Um, but it starts to then raise the question around what should we be practicing? So if we're talking about the importance of preparation for uh, optimizing performance and helping manage nerves, then what should we be practicing? So from musicians, you could think, well, I just need to keep going over my notes, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep, keep going over them. And if I practice enough, everything will be fine on the night. Uh, but of course, we know that getting through the notes is one thing when you're by yourself in the practice room. And when you're uh, on stage under the spotlights in front of hundreds of people, uh, that's a very very different experience and if you haven't thought about those environmental differences and how that might impact your focus and attention your ability to monitor uh, the situation uh, engage with and read the audience all of those kinds of things if you haven't thought about that before and if you haven't consciously tried to practice for that or prepare for that in some way mm -hmm. um, all of your 10,000 hours of practice or whatever it might have been on the notes can be for, for not much of anything at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an interesting one as well as this, certainly in my own experience, to begin with, uh, I think my attentional focus was very much on myself and how I was feeling and if I was feeling anxious. Uh, and I, I've noticed this in, in other kinds of performance too. But I think as, as people become more experienced, they become more able to think that it's not just about them, it's about who that performance is for or where it's going to land or how other people will perceive it. And so sort of widen out their, their their sort of cone of awareness uh, and start to think differently. And I think that, that that also goes with this business of how you frame the physical experience that you encounter, which is, you, you know, your heart beating fast and your hands going sweaty and, and beginning to tremble, all that kind of thing. And whether you frame that as, as fear or excitement. And I mm -hmm. think because the, the, the physical experience is very much the same in both, isn't it? And I think that that Certainly in my experience, the, the, the more I did it, the more I became able to frame these feelings as a, a pleasurable expectation of a challenging but worthwhile experience that I knew how to do, even if there were things about it that I couldn't predict. And I knew I'd have to think on my feet and, and improvise and do all those things. But nonetheless, it was a 
it was a um, a positive experience of going into something that was worthwhile and that I wanted to do, rather than being scared stiff that it was something I couldn't I couldn't cope with. And and that sort of shrinking inward looking approach is very different from that sort of expanding outward looking approach. And I think to a large extent, um, that's something that people have agency over. Not completely, I'm sure, but. Uh, but that is something that, that is worth working on, I think, to convert the one into the other um, when you get to a certain point. Terry, do you think that makes sense in, in mm. performance terms? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'd like to come on in a second to the, the, the sense of the performance science and some of the, the projects that you guys are involved in. I'm, I'm going to read out a couple of uh, uh, comments first. And then there's also a way to ask you about uh, sort of measuring performance as well. I know, uh, I think uh, Roger mentioned it a little bit, but I think we had a couple of questions on that as well. But uh, so to read out a couple of questions, Julie, uh, picking up on the sort of the value of nerves potentially or ways that you could maybe use it in a positive sense. Julie says, I am, I'm a performer. It's good to have some nerves before a live performance, which keeps us on our feet. Then the nerves go as I enjoy seeing the audience, uh, sort of seeing the audience appreciation of what they're seeing live. So that, uh, as in her performance, Julie has that ability to have sort of two-way feedback, which sort of helps her settle down. Then uh, uh, Ananya, I'm a musician creating urban world fusion music. So much of the live performances are about creating an immersive audio, visual, emotional environment. That sounds amazing. Uh, uh, if you can do that in lockdown, that would be incredible. I don't know what that looks like uh, in this current situation. Um, so yeah, so in terms of sort of measuring a, a good performance, um, if within the sense of performance science, uh, have you, uh, uh, have you? Did you have to agree on what uh, some criteria of what counts as a, a, a good performance in that sense? Uh, we had a question from T who asked, "How is a good performance measured as a science?" Um, so um, maybe Terry, I could come to you with that question. Yeah, this is a huge issue. So uh, around the evaluation and measurement of performance, uh, a colleague of mine in the, in the Center for Performance Science just recently completed a PhD trying to un untangle this. Um, it, it's funny because we do a lot of evaluation within music, of course, there are competitions and, and we've even, or we're also about to start uh, auditioning students to enter the Royal College of Music students. So we assume that we can do this kind of thing and we assume that it can be agreed upon what this, how this is done and, and what we look at. Um, but we know it's not quite that straightforward. Um, nonetheless, we can look at uh, the sort of in, from a musical sense, we can try and look at the quality of a performance itself, perhaps, if we could even agree uh, how we might be able to uh, achieve that. Uh, but we can also then start to look at um, uh, trying to identify and measure some of that the skills, perhaps, or, or capacities underpinning performance as well, both the musical ones, but then starting to look at some of the uh, the, the psychological skills, or the communicative skills, or some some of those other things as well. And we can start to try and look at some of those and understand their contributions to performance quality as a whole. And if we can understand those things uh, and get a sense of them, then that puts us in a position to to teach and train those things in our students. Yeah. Okay, and then with the I'd like to get sort of uh, get into a bit more detail about how some of the, the these principles, these uh, sort of commonalities and similarities that we talked about between the two worlds of music and uh, medicine, and how they have sort of manifested themselves within some of the projects that the centre has been involved in. Um, I wonder. Uh, we also had a question. Uh, from Naomi, which is about what gave you ins inspiration to investigate this in the first place. So there might be an opportunity, maybe if I come to you, Roger, if you could explain a bit more about the centre, how it came about. And then I wonder if uh, uh, there's a couple of projects I think we were going to talk to people about. Maybe the if you could talk about the operating theatre simulation, Roger, and then we'll come to the the, uh, the performance simulator later. But maybe, Roger, if you could start off by setting the scene a little bit for the CPS. How it came yeah, about. so so I mean I, I know um, so I, I jointly lead the Centre for Performance Science between Imperial and the Royal College of Music with my colleague at the RCM Aaron Williamson, who for many years had been running a Centre for Performance Science at the Royal College of Music. But about five years ago, maybe more, um, he and I came together and started thinking about what would happen if we thought about performance as something that wasn't rooted to one specific discipline like music or, or even medicine. But, but what would happen if we looked across music and medicine and science and drama and engineering and law courts and lecture theaters, all, all kinds of things, and looked at those sports field as instances of performance and what, what might we find? And so 
we came up with the idea really of of trying to explore what one of these worlds would look like when seen through the eyes of somebody from another. And at that time, I'd been doing a lot of stuff uh, around developing simulations of surgical procedures, particularly for, first of all, for surgeons and their teams, but then for members of the general public. Physical simulations very often of creating, let's say, an operation so that people could watch it or even scrub up and take part in something that seemed like a realistic operation, but was actually uh, a sort of enactment. So it was quite safe. No patients got actually hurt if anything went wrong, but it was pretty realistic. And we developed the idea of developing a low cost portable simulation, which we called distributed simulation that allowed us to set this up in science fairs and, and all sorts of places, including the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Um, and so when Aaron and I, and, and this, this provided a way of presenting what happened in an operating theater, say, but inviting musicians to come and take part as members of an operating team, say. Uh, and so we developed the idea between us that perhaps it would be possible to develop a, a, a simulator for musical performance. So here's an example of, um, of an operation, a simulated operation taking place. You can see that we've got a couple of people standing around the operating theater. Um, in the background, there's the surgeon and the assistant. In the foreground, there's a much younger member of the public holding one of these retractors that I talked about. You can see what looks like um, somebody's intestines there. It's actually made out of silicon, uh, but it's very realistic and it gives you the sense of the, the physicality of an operating theatre. And so we thought, well, maybe we could capture the physicality of other kinds of performance space. Um, and so we, we, we started then looking at what might a musical performance space, you know, what would be the, the, the key characteristics of a musical performance space, obviously a place where it happened and then an audience. Um, and so here's where I need to, to hand over to Terry to talk about the musical side of simulation. Yeah, if you can talk about the performance simulator, Terry. I think we've got a picture of of that as well from a. In a we do. A I think we have one from the backstage area. Setting, so. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so this is a uh, one of our students actually playing within the performance simulator. So, back to my points earlier around um, musicians spend a lot of time in the practice room, but they don't spend quite so much time in the the concert hall. Um, obviously, there are one or two logistical challenges uh, with with having our, our concert spaces on standby and audiences willing and ready to, to to spring to action as soon as a student wants to practice performing. Um, so, we took Roger's uh, concept of distributed simulation and tried to identify the key salient features of a performance space. So for us, uh, that involves moving, not just playing, performing, but actually moving through a series of activities or uh, phases or parts of the performance. So here are students standing in our backstage area about to walk through the stage door to be greeted by uh, the audience you can see on the screen there. Um, on stage, they're going to be underneath the spotlight, um, the usual cues of uh, you know, pianos for accompaniment, uh, curtains frame the space, those sorts of things are all, all built into it as well. And so having this space then gives us the opportunity to work with our students to help them practice performing then. So and helping them realize that performance isn't just simply a matter of, of running through uh, and correctly correctly, whatever that might be, playing the notes, but, but looking a little bit more broadly or expansively at everything else that contributes to the success of a performance, as we were talking about, um, but also uh, how they might be able to work on those things. So, so the value of having uh, this sort of se sequential aspect to it, mm -hmm. where they can move through the different phases, is that it lets us start and stop and work at elements within those. So going back to the comments around performance anxieties we were talking around before. So there's everything in relation to preparation that feeds into that. But of course, there are a lot of strategies that one can employ in the moment, uh, just immediately before one walks through the stage door. And so using our performance simulator, we can actually sort of hold people or work with people in the backstage area uh, around a, and, and make use or, or teach them all sorts of uh, physically focused strategies or cognitively focused strategies that they can then practice in the simulator uh, to then get ready to use in real life. I mean, one of the things that struck me about this when we first started working together with musicians and surgeons is that, is that actually, although to, in, in one way, what, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment, here is, here is a, a flautist performing to a, an audience that is clearly not a real audience because it's on a screen and it's digital sort of avatars and they, they, they respond, but it's, it's clearly a simulation. But that doesn't seem to matter 
any more than in the simulated operating theater. It doesn't seem to matter that quite clearly it's not a real operation, it's a simulation of an operation. Because I think although some things are, are clearly not particularly realistic, other things, and I think it's mainly the things about performing, are. And that sense of of nerves and doing something in front of other people and mm -hmm. and and sort of being on view, and and we found this a, a lot with with the, the medical students certainly in our in our surgical simulators. It's been it's been very striking. Natasha, do you want to say a little bit about some of that work that we've been doing recently? Mm, absolutely. Um, so just coming. I think it depends. You have to think very carefully about who your target audience is and what you want them to learn when you're running a simulation of this sort. So particularly with medical students and junior medical students who haven't spent an enormous amount of time in real operating theatres, it can be a sort of anxiety inducing um, learning experience to go into the operating theatre and do things for the first time. Um, and we can replicate those sort of experiences um, and we do that by by creating a sort of pop-up surgical theater in a small area of space. Um, and I might just ask if we could have that slide put up there, the one that shows the theater itself with everybody coming inside. And if we have enough elements um, that allow the people who are entering the simulation to suspend their disbelief and start actually behaving as they would in a real operating theater, um, then the participants very quickly forget that it's pretend. Um, and some of the key elements of that are having the equipment that makes it look like a real operating theatre. Um, and other elements of it are having staff who can realistically make it feel like a clinical scenario. So we get real surgical consultants, people like Roger or other colleagues to come and help run the simulation and put that feeling of pressure on the students and ask them to react to maybe a hostile colleague or something like that. But unlike real life, they don't leave that simulation feeling terrible. They leave it and we all sit down and say, actually, why did that happen? Why was there hostility and anxiety? Give feedback about how they dealt with it and normally dealt with it really well and, and then work together through strategies. Um, so you can see here exactly the operating theater that we set up. And this would be what would happen after we've run a simulation and um, where we then invite all the participants inside to talk about what happened and what went well and what didn't go well in a debriefing process to help sort of um, come to terms with the performance itself. And it turns out there's a lot of crossover because we've done some very interesting stuff over the last few years with, with particularly with, with, with Terry, with, with uh, music students, postgraduate students, and with uh, postgraduate surgical students, bringing them together to experience one another's world. So having musicians taking part in surgery, having surgeons practicing uh, a, a straightforward choral piece and then performing it in the performance simulator um, to 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 explore some of these aspects of performance that do not require specialist knowledge because nobody expects musicians to be able to operate or surgeons to be able to sing. And so, I wondered, um, the, sorry, well, I was going to ask yeah, either you or Natasha. In terms of, I, I'm just putting my mind, putting myself in the shoes of sort of a medical student. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I am 100% convinced that this this sort of education is hugely valuable, but it might not have been what they expected to be uh, the way they expected to be taught potentially or uh, when they first signed up for a sort of a medical degree at uh, a, a university like imperial what sort of reaction have you got maybe terry as well from your musical students what sort of maybe well, i'll start with you maybe natasha from the medical students what sort of reactions have you got have the, have the students been completely on board with it straight away did it take a little bit of uh, sort of it convincing or sort of showing them the, the benefits? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that when you put the music students in a musical simulator and the medical students in a medical simulator, it's very easy for them to see the immediate benefit. But where something really interesting happens is as Roger was just talking, where we take the doctors and put them in a musical simulator and we take the musicians and put them in a surgical simulator. Um, and that is something for people to get their heads around a little bit because we're actually removing them from their own subject matter expertise and we're asking them to focus in an isolated way on teamwork and performance in a field that is completely different to their own. Um, and sometimes people are a little bit skeptical about that to start because they weren't expecting to be doing ensemble choral pieces and a musical simulator when, when they're doctors. But what we found is that if you can frame it so that you're clearly demonstrating what you're interested in exploring. So if you're saying we acknowledge that all of these um, professions struggle with performance anxiety and teamwork under time pressure 
and we're going to ask you to isolate that skill. And then you actually put people in and get them to experience it. They start to see and make the connections for themselves. Um, and that is where people really stop being skeptical and get on board. Um, because just telling people that there are lots of similarities isn't the same as showing them. And when you ask people to practice these same skills in a different setting, they can see how it's relevant um, and have been generally very well received, would you say, Terry? It has been, yeah. I, I would agree that, um, to your question, James, that there is initially some, um, not so much resistance to the idea of doing it, but um, uncertainty around whether there's actually going to be any any parallel or overlap that um, students will think, okay, this is going to be fun. Uh, I get to gown up and assist with a surgery. But, you know, other than fun, it, it kind of stops there. Um, but coming out of the session by the end of it, um, the students have managed to identify all, all sorts of, of quite quite fascinating parallels. Um, but just to bring in one more, sorry, Roger, jump in if you'd rather talk about this instead. But one of the things, it, it's not just about putting um, the sort of music students in the, the operating simulator and the, the surgical students in the music simulator. We put them in mixed groups. So they'll go through with two musicians and two surgeons at the same time. So the idea with this is that not only do they get a chance to experience another discipline, so musicians get to experience surgery, for instance, but they're doing it alongside the others. And in that, even when the musicians then are in the music performance simulator, they get to watch the surgeons reacting to and trying to make sense of, of the musical world. And the surgeons will, will ask them questions around why are you doing this or, or how would you approach these sorts of things. Um, and so that offers a number of benefits, but one of them is that it then allows, in this case, musicians to see the world of music performance through another's eyes uh, mm -hmm. without all the biases, the assumptions that they have. And so it can be an opportunity for them to really question some of their assumptions or it brings to light some of their assumptions, uh, some of their ways of thinking that they've never really questioned or, or challenged before. Um, so that offers them the opportunity to reconsider what it is that they do, as well as having this, this um, the, these novel, fresh perspectives offered by by somebody else i just wanted to go to a couple a couple more questions we've had sent in uh, to cover those before we go into the last uh, and i had a final question uh, myself uh, we have a question from vivian uh, she asked if roger and natasha are, are aware of a script running in their head that evaluates their performance in the moment are you when you're performing in your in your roles in this or roger when you were performing in your roles in sort of the medical setting did you did you have a yeah a, a script or, or a set of instructions that you were following or, or were you sort of in the moment and just relying on your instincts what um, maybe first natasha you well, yeah I'll, I'll let to, go to roger i think well, okay. i'm interested to, to see what natasha's response is as well i mean certainly as a gp I, th I think as a surgeon not particularly because i was at an earlier stage in yeah but, but when i became a gp and started to think about it differently I, I became more and more aware of multiple conversations going on in my head and one of them would be the one with my patient then and there and trying to create an environment a, a setting where they felt comfortable a sort of conversational thing another one was the one that said you, you, you know this patient has got nicotine stained fingers and has a has had a cough for three weeks and doesn't look particularly well could it be cancer could it be bronchitis could it, you know all those medical questions a third one might be um uh, the last consultation took twice as long as I wanted it to and now I'm running a bit late and I've got four visits to do and uh, and another one again might be my daughter's got chicken pox and I hope she's you know all these things going on at the same time and I was aware of sort of parallel strands um, and and needing to manage those parallel strands while still uh, ensuring that the patient with me didn't think, oh, here is somebody who's distracted and not interested in my story at all uh, and just waiting for me to get out so that he can get on with his visits. No, I wanted it to work as a performance. Um, but I think the more experienced I got, the more, I think the more aware of that I became. N Natasha, does that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're junior, the dominant script, the dominant narrative going on in your head is the biomedical one, is fitting all of the symptoms into the scaffold to figure out what's going on and make sure you get the right treatment. Um, but that script alone is seldom enough to, to create a meaningful, satisfactory interaction with a patient. So as you start to progress, you start to try to hold multiple scripts, the conversation that's happening, as well as a medical script that is is more invisible in your mind. I wanted to. Uh, so my final question was going to uh, was going to be around. I was going to. I'm going to put this to you, Terry, which is around the application of this of performance science and some of the work that's being done at the CPS to other 
work and other social settings outside of medicine and music. Uh, I also wanted to, I, I don't know if you can work this in or it's an interesting sort of second question from that we had sent in by Elise, which was, would this work have consequences in artificial intelligence to improve the talent capabilities in motions of virtual performance? So I don't know if that's one potential example of a future application, but if you could maybe re re respond to that or just talk more generally about other other areas this work could be applied to. Right, thanks James. Um, well, yes, that's one of the things that we're particularly interested within the Center for Performance Science at the moment is looking at when we use the lens of performance and start to look across at other domains which would not uh, traditionally consider what they view uh, what they do to be performance, what starts to come to light? Uh, what things do we start to see at that point? Uh, so for instance, we do a lot of work within business with governments uh, anyways. Um, we work within entrepreneurship as well. Um, uh, so a, a number of other disciplines where we're finding actually um, the kinds of concepts that um, we explore, that, that we work on, we, we strive to develop with our music students, uh, apply to, to medical students, to apply to uh, science and technology students, entrepreneurship, business executives, government ministers, all of these kinds of things. And so we, when we use this lens of performance, uh, as I say, it brings to the fore, it brings to light all sorts of opportunities to look at what contributes to, again, just this, the success of what it is that people are doing, whatever that, that domain might be, and how we can then work with them to optimize um, that uh, greater success of it, greater enjoyment, uh, all of those sorts of things as well. Um, to your second point around the use of this for uh, artificial intelligence, it's... Um, it's an area we haven't moved into a whole lot yet, although we are starting to move now into virtual and augmented reality and looking at how we can be using some of those principles within that. Um, and so that will certainly involve uh, very, or you can you can imagine how very shortly down the road that will start to incorporate uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and some of those principles into it as well. And so as we get a better understanding of the skills, the capabilities that underpin performance, um, the mindsets, the attitudes that go along with that as well, then absolutely when we understand those things separate from music performance or sporting performance or whatever it might be, but those core principles that understand performance, then absolutely that can start to inform how we continue to uh, develop artificial intelligence and interactions with it. Thank you so much, for that, Terry. I'm just aware of the time. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. But that sort of future-looking potential down the road work is, a, I guess, quite a nice area to sort of finish finish up on. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for that response. Um, so yeah, like I said, unfortunately, that does bring a, bring us to the end of this lunchtime discussion. Uh, I wanted to. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Roger, Natasha and Terry for, for joining us for this. What's been a really, really interesting talk. Uh, I, I hope it has some impact on how my future performance is. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll watch it again. You certainly, everyone at home can watch this again. So the Great Exhibition Road Festival YouTube channel, this video will be hosted there, as will all future um, uh, recorded pieces and, and, and things that we produce for the festival. They'll all be there for you to watch again uh, in your own time. Um, my colleague is going to be posting a, a link in the chat, which has a link to our evaluation form. So for everyone who's watching at home on YouTube, please do take a couple of minutes to fill that in. That really helps us, uh, um, it really helps us sort of uh, yeah, improve these events and, and come up with new ideas and new topics and new themes that we might explore at future, future ones. But um, I think that's otherwise that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry, Natasha and Roger. I don't know if you want to do a virtual wave goodbye whilst we do a virtual round of applause to thank you for everything <laughs> you've done and all the fascinating things you've uh, covered today. Um, that's kind of it from me. Thank you so much, everyone who tuned in. Uh, have a wonderful uh, Thursday afternoon and we'll see you very soon with more content from the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Thank you very much. <laughs>